Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good morning. Glad to see so many beautiful, amazing, handsome faces in the room and excited to see all of our family that's joining us online. Uh, you guys, listen, I am super pumped about this new sermon series that we begin today. And uh, it's based out of a book that was written by Mark Batterson. He's the pastor of a uh, national church in D.C. It's called Win the Day. Now, the, the book title says, Seven Habits to Help You Stress Less and Accomplish More. It's all founded in scripture. Here's what I want you to hear. Um, Mark Batterson is an incredible pastor. He's got an amazing way of reaching people. They have a coffee shop in D.C. called Ebenezer's. It's a Christian coffee shop that is one block over from the train station. It is frequented by all the people on Capitol Hill. I'm back this up just a smidge. Um, it isn't overtly Christian. You don't go in and get scripture shoved down your throat. You don't go in and get whacked on the head with a Bible. But it is bathed in the love of Christ. It is captured and, and promoted in all the truths of scripture. So while I have changed our sermon title to say seven biblical lessons to help us stress less and accomplish more, and then you look at the book for some of you and you're like, but that's not what it says. It is all scripture. Mark Batterson has a brilliant way of engaging the non-Christian community in the world of self-help and getting your life better and instilling scripture and principles from the Bible into them. And so we are not entering a worldly self-help sermon series. Does everybody hear me loud and clear? We are, we are entering seven biblical habits that when we incorporate them daily will help us stress less and actually get the mission that God has called us to get done, done. Does that sound good to anybody else? Like, stress and anxiety are the number one negative in our society right now. Mental health, it's like anything we can do to stress less and then to be more on mission, I mean, come on, that's good stuff. So we're going to spend the next seven weeks learning from Scripture some meaningful habits that we can incorporate into our daily lifestyle that will help not bring glory to ourselves, to improve our own lives for sure, to live, because what did Jesus say that? Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come that we may have life and have it in abundance, in fullness, absolutely. That's what this is all about. But that fullness of life is to grow and glorify God's kingdom and not promote our own platforms. But that's another sermon, so we'll get there, okay? So are we ready to jump into this? All right, so this first week, we want to talk about what it means to flip the script, um, and, and so let me back up a little bit. Y'all, we all have a story we tell ourselves, right? Oh, nobody else has a story. Nobody else has voices. Pastor Ricky, we're talking about those voices in your head. The story you tell yourself about who you are, the story you tell yourself about your past, you can call it your self-talk, you can call it your narrative, you can call it your personal story. There's all kinds of catchphrases, Right? But it's the difference between I'm a victim and I'm a victor. It's the difference between I'm the abusee and I'm the survivor. It's the difference between I'm just broken and I got a story to tell where God has redeemed my brokenness and made me new. And so that flipping the script, that going from test to testimony, from victim to victor, from tragedy to triumph. We got to get that set in our heads before we can jump into some of those other things because our perspective about who we are dictates, sets the standard for what we believe about everything else. Now, can I tell you that nowhere is this more apparent in Scripture to me anyway than in the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. You see, God's people had been enslaved. And um, in the middle of that enslavement, things had got, like, they were good at first, Joseph in the coat of many colors, and Joseph and his brothers, like, Joseph gets enslaved but goes to Egypt, and things are really good for a while. But Pharaoh's progress, time goes on, and things get really really bad. 
And we have the whole story of Moses and, and God sending Moses to tell Pharaoh to set his people free. And, and, and that, this all happens. But here, if you're not familiar with the story, or it's been a while, here's what you need to know for today. God's people had one identity. And it wasn't God's people, it was slave. It was defeated. It was oppressed. But God delivered them. But God, with a whole bunch of slaves and no army, parted the Red Sea and defeated the greatest army on the planet at the time. But God took his people who were slaves and caused the Egyptians to load them up with gold and spices and textiles and all the things that they would need to go establish their nation. God freed his people and set them up to go to this promised land that he told them about. Does that sound good to anybody else? <laughs> the problem was, uh, let's not be hard on them. Have you ever been in a season of captivity in your life where things were just dark? <laughs> like, ever? Anybody? I'm going to, like, raise both hands and a foot, okay? Heels and all, because so many times, right? Like, we've been there. And when someone looks at us and says, there's light on the other side. There's a promise. You don't have to stay here. You're going to get through the darkness. Does everybody else just jump up and down and go, yeah, I believe that to the depths of my soul. No problem. <laughs> or do we often struggle to believe? That's where we find the Israelites. They're struggling to believe. And they're not only struggling, but what happens when you struggle? Mm. Are you cheerful or grouchy when you're struggling? Super sunshiny. Oh, Pastor Rick, is, is, when he is struggling, he is never grumpy. He is always cheerful. That's what he said. And I'm just going to affirm whatever my husband No, I can't even do that. Um, all right, we're just going to move on. <laughs> I know, I can't, baby, I love you. I'm not, I won't tell on you, but I cannot endorse that falsehood. So, um, I know I am certainly grumpy when I'm going through it. Y'all, some of you know I'm in the midst of struggling with the kidney stone, and there were a couple times yesterday that I replied to my husband in a less than loving way, because I'm struggling, and I was like, mm. Yeah, anyway, let's move on with the scripture quick before I get in trouble. So I want to invite you guys to read with me as the Israelites are in the middle of their struggle, okay? Read this passage with me in Numbers. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Tibera, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. All right, I want to back up. It says, the people complained about their hardships. So we have to ask the question, what were the hardships? What is it that they're complaining about? Like, are they legit hardships? Because a lot of times we look back through here... And we're like, what is wrong with y'all? You, you, mm. But let's talk about what the hardships were. Because we know God delivered them, but, but, but there was a little hiccup with them, you see. And they were living in the desert. Are food and water plentiful in the desert? Is it comfy cozy in the desert? Y'all, I, I was in Egypt for three weeks on a deployment. It wasn't even a hard deployment. The soles of my brand new desert boots wore down to nothing in three short weeks because the sand and the rocks are rough. It's hot and it's gross and it's just not a whole lot of fun. But we all know I'm an up north girl. I, but you know what? My fellow Floridians that were standing and deployed, but standing beside me and deployed with me, they didn't like it any more than I did. 
all right? The desert's not a fun place to be. Yeah, I'm going to hold off on that. (laughs) They only had one food to eat. It was this manna. There was no normal food. Now, they're in the middle of the desert wilderness, and they have food, so that's pretty amazing. But it's one thing. Anybody go through that phase when they were a little kid where they only ate one thing, like you only ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or you only ate, like, and then your parents are going, what is wrong with you? And every doctor says the same thing. They'll grow out of it, and they do. Imagine breakfast, lunch, and dinner for years eating one thing. Now, the manna was a miracle. It was miraculous heavenly food from God, but still. And they left everything they knew to do this. So that, that feels a little hard. I mean, can, can we understand why they'd be a little grumpy? Does that feel hard? Does that sound hard to anybody else? If we're being honest, family online, does that sound hard to you to do that? That's one side of the story. You see, if we look, I actually I'm going to read for you in Exodus 15, 25, It says, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Because see, in the desert, you need water. But they couldn't find water, or the water wasn't any good that they found. And it says, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water became fit to drink. So they went from no water to bitter water to miraculously good water. Like Deer Park has nothing. Evian has nothing on the water they were drinking. Smart water got nothing on the water they were drinking. The next verse, it says, God says, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what's right, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So not only they have good water, they have a promise of living disease-free and being healed. Starting to sound a little bit better? Maybe a little? Exodus 16, 4, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. God was providing them just enough because God was teaching them dependence. But as they gathered in the hearing of the Lord. They didn't rehearse the miracles. They they didn't proclaim what God had done. It doesn't say that they were like, thank you for the miraculous manna, and thank you for the super awesome water, and thank you for keeping us disease-free. Thank you for healing all our illnesses. It says, man, we're sick of eating the same thing all the time. God, what is your problem? (laughs) We never sound like that. You see, as humans, we tend to remember the things we ought to forget and forget the things that we really, really need to remember. So the question I have for us as we start this message is, what am I remembering about my life, about my current circumstance, about my past struggles? What is it that I am remembering? What am I rehearsing over and over in my mind. Is my self-talk all about God's provision? Maybe a miraculous escape? Is my self-talk about God's promises? Or is my self-talk all about my lack? All about my failures? All about my shortcomings? Rather than God's abundance. You hear the phrase often that attitude determines altitude. I want to turn that just a little bit. What are you focused on? Because what you are focused on consumes your field of vision. What do I mean by that? Anybody ever... um, been out somewhere and and seen something like I do a lot. I sit out on the deck all the time. I love animals. I love the woods. I love the mountains. So I'll frequently find myself in a spot of nature and I will see something with my eye and I'll want to get a picture of it. And so I'll pull up my 
fancy little iPhone. Actually, mine's not that fancy. It only has one camera. I have not upgraded. But um, <laughs> pull up my phone and zoom all the way in or grab my binoculars and zoom all the way in. And when I'm zoomed, all I can see is the leaves. Like I can't find the thing I was trying to find to get the picture of or to look closer at. Anybody else struggle to like target the thing? Yeah. So you have to take the binoculars down or to put the phone down and find it again so that you can then zoom in and focus on it. And our tendency as humans is to take whatever the negative thing is, whatever the hardest thing is, whatever the biggest hurt is, and we zoom in on it. And it, and it, consumes our entire field of vision. We are not going to Mary Poppins this thing. In no way am I saying you shouldn't acknowledge the negative. In no way am I saying you should forget the struggles altogether. In no way am I saying that tragedy isn't tragedy and that trauma wasn't trauma. I am saying that we need to take a few steps back so we can see the whole picture including the future that God is calling us into that is very far away from the tragedy, the trauma, the failure, or the sin. As far as the east is to the west, how are we doing, church? All right. So the people were complaining. Let, let's keep reading in Numbers 11. We're going to read verses 4 to 6 together. The rabble with them began to crave other food. Pause. I love like that. We hear the rabble rousers. The, the, the scripture just says the rabble. The rabble within them began to crave other food. Okay, pick up. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Man, I was, I'm a vegetable girl. I was getting a little hungry reading this passage. Man, leeks, onions, garlic, that's a soup waiting to happen right there. Another account in Exodus 16 says, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Yeah, grouchy. We already looked at the circumstances that they were currently in, what God was giving them. But let's look back because in verses 4 to 6 of Numbers 11, it says, we remember what we ate in Egypt at no cost. The rabble said they ate it at no cost. Um, read with me Exodus 11, or I'm sorry, Exodus 1, verses 11 to 14. Let's talk about the cost. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Worked them what? Ruthlessly. ruthlessly, okay. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Free lunch, huh? Hmm, they're being worked pretty hard. Let's see what else that's not at any cost at all. Can we have that next passage? The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sifra and Hua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Next verse. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born to you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. They ate pots of meats and melons and onions and garlic and leeks at no cost. 
make no mistake, there was a tremendous cost. Sometimes we are stuck in captivity and we become blind and numb to the price we pay. It's how we survive. It's part of a survival mechanism that God has instilled in us. Like, talk to a mother. We, we have a midwife in the room. Talk to a mother in the middle of labor. She's never doing this again. <laughs> Ten minutes after the baby's born and she's holding that precious little one, that pain goes by the wayside, right? Well, unlike childbirth, captivity is no good. And far too often, we stay in captivity, staying in the old script, staying in the old bondage because we blind ourselves to the suffering and the pain. We numb ourselves and we tell ourselves it's okay. And make no mistake, God called them into freedom. They still had to cross a desert. They still had to flee from the biggest army in the world. They didn't know what was going to happen till they didn't even know what was going to happen when God said, Moses, just hold your staff over the water. Moses still didn't know. God had a plan, and it was amazing. But they had to walk through the hot desert in fear and in faith. And there's a lot of times coming out of captivity that it's scary. Coming out of bondage is scary. But, but God has a plan. And I can tell you this, the cost of freedom is always a better price to pay than the cost of captivity. Ask any soldier, Air Force, Marine, Navy, whatever you want to say. Ask any member of the armed services. The price of freedom is worth it. But it is, it is, not, it is not free. When God calls us out of captivity into freedom, we do have to weigh the cost, but we have to tell ourselves we have to believe the promise that freedom is better, that freedom is worth the cost. And, and I think we have to, because we forget what we ought to remember and remember and focus on what we ought to forget, when we start to feel a certain way about how it used to be, when our brains know how it used to be wasn't good, or when we're in the middle of trying to break free of the thing and it is pulling us back, we need to remember to not just operate in our feelings, but to look at the facts. See, the, the rabble people, they weren't looking at the facts. It was free. And all we have now is suffering. When in truth, there was grave cost to where they were before. And God was providing every single need, even though it was uncomfortable. How do we balance facts and feelings? We do that in prayer. We do that with the truth of Scripture. And y'all, sometimes, look, I, like counseling step number one with me when you're trying to make a decision, make a fact-based pro or con list. <laughs> make a fact-based list. <laughs> and then walk your feelings through that. More importantly, walk your feelings through the lens of Scripture, which is the absolute truth, the absolute fact, the absolute honest answer from God. The enemy is the father of lies and deceit. He is constantly trying to assault our minds with a false narrative and a skewed story. And church, with us, it is our responsibility to look at God's story, to look at the truth of our past and to walk in that because God continually does not tell us we are a failure and doomed to never be better. God continually promises us through the blood of Jesus that we are a new creation, that we have been redeemed, that he does cast our sin as far as the east is from the west, that he will heal our wombs, that he will free his people, that there is restoration and not just restoration, redemption, that God will restore the years the locust ate. And that doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get there, but his promises are true. But we must choose whose voice we believe. We must choose whose voice we believe because it determines our future. 
Church, flipping the script means allowing Scripture to be the cure. I wish that I'd kind of done a slide for this. He did a little play in the book. Like if you think of the word Scripture, script, add a C, cure. Scripture is the cure for our past. It's the cure for us zoning in on a negative story that is a false narrative. It is the truth God speaks over our life. The reality is that Israel spent 40 years on the journey from captivity to promise. And it shouldn't have taken that long. Do you know how long it should have taken? Any ideas? 11 days. Deuteronomy 1-2 says it takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Bardia by the Mount Seir Road. Why would they spend 40 years on an 11-day journey? Because they kept looking back instead of believing what God told them about what was forward. The narrative we tell ourselves matters. The story we believe matters because it impacts our actions and it impacts generations. You see, there were these two guys named Joshua and Caleb. And and when, when Israel first came out of Egypt, they get to the promised land, to the edge of the promised land, and they decide they're going to send in 12 spies to scope things out while they wait to hear from the Lord about how they're supposed to take this promised land, what's supposed to happen. And there's 12 guys that pretty much go unnamed, but two guys get named, Joshua and Caleb. And so they go and spend time in the land, and they come back. Now, what has God promised the people at this point? Promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God has promised them victory. God has promised them freedom. God has promised them protection. God has promised them a hope and a future. Promised, not maybe, guaranteed. These 12 guys go spend time in the promised land, and they come back. And and 10 say, it's a great land flowing with milk and honey, but there's giant people, and they're going to slaughter us. They're going to kill us. They're going to oppress us. It's going to be worse than Egypt. It's going to be awful. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. It's not going to work. What did God say to them? God didn't even tell them to pause and send the spies into the land. That's a whole other thought for a whole other day. God promised them victory in a land flowing with milk and honey. And two guys, Joshua and Caleb, those two guys, they said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and there are giants, and they are big, but God said, but God said, When you're facing your giants, what did God say? What did God say to you? Don't hear me the wrong way. This is not a name it and claim it. I did not say, what did Jen say to herself about the prayer closet in the prayer closet before she went and charged some giant? Because that's a good way for Jen to get herself killed. (laughs) What did God say? What does God tell you? And it starts here, because if what you hear, the voice you hear doesn't line up with this, you're not hearing God's voice. He never contradicts himself. What does God say? And Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, all that's true. But God said, we're going to take this land. And the 10 had voices louder than the two. And the people complained and grumbled. And they chose not to trust God. And God got real upset. (laughs) I have no doubt that God also knew they would need the time. But God got real upset. And then the 11-day journey became 40 years because God said, none of you, none of you men that I sent into the land will walk into that land and take it. Except the two. Except the two who not only heard my voice, but trusted my voice. Not even Moses. Moses had a temper tantrum along the way, and it cost him. 
see, while it takes 11 days to get from Egypt to the promised land, it took 40 years to get Egypt out of God's people so they could enter the promised land. That's 11 days plus 14,589 days. How often do we stay in captivity years longer than God ever intended for us to? Because God has taken us out of the captivity, but we haven't taken the captivity out of our hearts. We haven't taken the pain and given it to him. We have held on and looked back and struggled. But God said, man, next time, if we could all just channel our inner Caleb, our inner Joshua. My Caleb happens to be super stubborn. I would say our Caleb but I got the stubborn parts all on me, so I I can look at that and be like, man, he's going to charge that hill no matter what. (laughs) For those of you online, uh, our son Caleb is in the room. Yeah, and he, well, I'm just going to read you this. So we know Joshua ends up, right, being Moses' successor. Joshua believed God for his promise, and and Joshua ends up being Moses' successor and leading the people into the promised land. But I want you to listen to this passage about Caleb. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You have heard yourself that the Anakites are there with their cities and they're large and fortified, but the Lord helping me. See, even in all his bravado, Caleb doesn't forget what he actually needs to conquer the land. He says, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as I said. At 85 years old, Going into the promised land, Caleb says, that's the hardest place up there. Give me that. I'm going to take that because God said, and I'm going to stand on God's promise, and he's going to help me do it. There is a hill country in your life, and it looks hard and high, and the giants look big, and I am here to tell you, God said He's got freedom for you. God said he's got a promised land for you. God said you are his chosen. And if you lean into him and don't try to do it on your own, but if you lean into him and go forth in his strength, in his power, in his humility and his love and his grace, then the hill country is yours because he gave it. Church, what has God promised you? More importantly, that what has God, well, not more importantly, what has God promised you? And whose words are you believing? Because if you're listening to the wrong voice, God's promise will never be effective in your life. What has God promised you and whose words are you believing? What story are you telling yourself? In no way am I negating anyone's past. (laughs) I know some of y'all's stories, and I sure know my story. I'm not trying to say there's not pain, and there's not hurt, there's not mistakes, and there's not problems. I am challenging you to see all of that through God's lens. I wanted to pull out one of the quotes from this book. Because this is where we so often get wrong, get it wrong. The number of counseling sessions that I sent in where the response of the heart is, I'm just messed up. I'm just broken. I'll never defeat this thing. I'll never beat this thing. I'll never get past. I'm just, you are just a child of God. You are just chosen for more. Mark Batterson says, a single failure can fashion a defeatist attitude. A single trauma can amputate a piece of a personality. A single rejection can destroy someone's capacity to trust. My point, he says, 
We need God to sanctify our memories as much as we pray for him to sanctify our imaginations. Where do you need to take the simple action step of asking God to come in and give you his eyes to see your past or your present, to see your struggle? Because our eyes are zoomed in on the thing, and we need God's vision to step back and see the whole, to see the entirety. You don't have to have great trauma in your life to succeed. You don't have to have great tragedy to be a tremendous victor. However, way too many people disqualify themselves because of their trauma or tragedy. And just a fun fact I found this week. Do you know that at least 15, 15 on record, 15 British prime ministers were orphaned before the age of 16? 15 members of the United Kingdom who reached the greatest elected office there is. 15 of them were orphans before they were the age 16. We, we saw the Israelite story. We saw Joshua and Caleb. By the way, Caleb was a little guy. <laughs> over and over, we see David defeat Goliath. We see the prostitute become uh, the pure woman in the lineage of Jesus himself. We over and over and over see God flip the script. And if we could just be open to that and not disqualify ourselves, church, some of us, some of you feel like there's just no way you can do it, that your past or your present is so stacked against you that you can't climb over that hill. And I saved all my reading from the book for the end. But I want to share with you. <laughs> okay, God is in nature. He teaches us lessons through nature, right? Amen? Amen? Because God created nature and all the things, right? I found this cute little true story so compelling. It says, when a ranch dog has puppies, the rancher identifies the smallest puppy, the runt of the litter by tying a piece of yarn around its neck. Any ideas why he would do that? Because what rancher would want the runt of the litter, right? Like, ranchers need ranch dogs to go herd the cattle. Like, one good ranch dog does the job of 10 ranchers, right? They need them to go do all the things. Who wants the runt? <laughs> it says they identify the runt of the litter by tying a piece of yarn around its neck. After 12 weeks, the rancher gives away all the puppies except the runt of the litter. Why? The runt always has to work harder to survive against its bigger brothers and sisters. Always. The runt becomes the smartest, the fastest, the most determined. Of all the puppies, the runt's heart is the biggest. And the rancher stakes his whole livelihood on that fact. Runts. <laughs> In Christ, God stakes the whole kingdom on who we are in him and what we can do, no matter what our past is. Flipping the script means building our lives on scripture and the promises of God. What story are you living in? I really want you to take a minute and think about that. If you were standing in the Israelites' camp now, would you be standing with the 10 or would you be standing with the two? None of your past matters. Abraham thought he was too old. Jeremiah thought he was too young. Moses thought he was unqualified. Joseph thought he was overqualified. Gideon had an inferiority complex, and Jonah had a superiority complex. Peter made too many mistakes. Nathaniel was too cool, and Paul had a thorn in the flesh. David was the runt of the litter. Who you are is not the issue. What really matters is whose you are. If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you are a new creation. 
You are the apple of God's eye. You are his workmanship and his masterpiece. You are more than a conqueror. Your weakness is made perfect in God's strength. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And eternity is your promise An abundant life, full life, is your promise, here and now. If we want to win the day, if we want to spend less time completely stressed out, and we actually want to get about the business of doing the work that God called us to do, whether that's in the church or the marketplace, in our families, then we got to flip the script. And the bottom line is this, we may not like our past, we may not like the old story, but God offers us a new story and a perfect identity, a perfected identity in him. I want to leave you with one more promise before Pastor Jessica comes up to pray. And I think it's going to change how we receive our blessing at the end of service from here on ever after. Because the priestly blessing you guys are familiar with, and I, you know, flip the words around, meaning is there. But the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The verse right after that, talking about a new identity, God himself says, so I will put my name on them. I will put my name on them, God said. God says he will put his name on you and me and you and you and you. God puts his name on us and he will bless us. Flip the script. Listen to the right voice. Change your story. Pastor Jessica. Hey, y'all. Some of us, um, maybe I'll just tell, speak for myself. I used to pray that I would be fearless, unafraid. But what I didn't know is what I would rather be is courageous. Because we get stuck in this place between our heads and our hearts where fear lives between there. And what God says is, do not be afraid because I am with you. But what that means is, the fear is there. Fear is real. The thing that keeps us stuck from walking into that new identity is the legit. But when we have courage in the Lord, we are choosing to step into the fullness of what he has for us. To overcome the fear by saying no to it. So I pray that we have courage. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you Mm. are the God of yes. (laughs) You're the God that gives us all the things that we need to do, all the things that you've called us to do. And when we are in the darkest, most fearful, difficult place, you have given us courage. Because you are with us, we can say yes to you. Mm. So, Lord, as we go forth from this place today, I pray over all of these within the sound of my voice that they would hear your voice and what the steps are to take that courageous action, whether it's a word or a thought or whether they start telling themselves a different truth, the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for this because in Jesus we are made whole, we are overcomers, And God, we are set free. We are victorious. Amen. Amen.